Great, thank you very much. And thanks again, Mehdi and Subhash, for this kind invitation. I must say, this is a provocative title. When I first saw that, it was like, you know, why a surgeon is a must, question mark. Uh, I thought, well, and it's like an exclamation point, of course, you need a surgeon and a team, and I'm gonna show how you can do this. But there's really a different question, and it's the same question or issue that, uh, that Justin raised. So why a surgeon is a must? Well, it's a no-brainer. You, you need a surgeon. And for those of you that are, have seen the slide before, uh, uh, the reason it's a no-brainer is sometimes there are disasters that require emergent therapy, like a patient with a huge groin hematoma. But more uh, importantly, there are some patients that may not uh, benefit just from endoluminal therapy. So those of you that take care of a lot of PAD and CLI patients, there are some patients that get a bypass, and I will tell you in our practice, it's probably not as uh, many as you would think. Uh, and I have partners like Norm Cummins and Mehdi Shishbord that literally do the same thing every day. They, they are doing endoluminal therapy, even though one's a surgeon and one's a cardiologist. But there are some patients that get a bypass, and these bypasses open up and stay open for a long period of time and do very well with this. But I think really the crux of this discussion is less about why a surgeon is a must, but talking about, again, uh, collaboration or multidisciplinary teams. And you can have two, uh, perhaps, uh, opposite positions, which is collaboration or competition. Clearly, interaction between multiple specialties is inherent in our practice in patients with vascular disease. Uh, and in fact, in, in many uh, areas, this really improves patient care. The critical question is whether collaboration or competition is better for the patient uh, and the institution. And I hope to prove to you collaboration is better for both. There are a couple of different models on how you can uh, practice in the vascular space. Um, autonomy, uh, where you have siloed care. Um, and one group uh, uh, is pitted against another group, and this could be cardiology, radiology, or vascular surgery, or other uh, areas. Integration, true integration, which is very rare. It's been tried at a couple of places, but that requires um, not only clinical integration, but fiscal integration uh, and leadership integration, and that's challenging. And finally, uh, collaboration, which uh, in a collaborative model, it may be a Venn diagram, uh, but you have overlapping interests and you align in terms of making sure to have excellent uh, uh, patient care and patient outcomes. So what's happened uh, uh, over, uh, let's say, the last decade or so at uh, university hospitals uh, where I work? Uh, if you go back uh, 20 years ago, um, th there was a uh, disparate uh, group of um, uh, endoluminal treatment uh, arenas uh, for uh, peripheral artery disease. Uh, interventional radiology did the wide uh, uh, bulk or the large bulk of those procedures. Vascular surgery did some. There was some overlap and really no overlap with the uh, interventional cardiology. And then fast forward 20 years, it's a little bit of a different diagram, and those circles also denote uh, the volume that's done in each uh, area. This is not just uh, the case for uh, peripheral artery disease or uh, critical limb ischemia, whether you talk about cerebrovascular disease, uh, you have overlapping interests in um, neurosurgery, uh, neurointerventional uh, vascular surgery, interventional cardiology, aortic disease, vascular surgery, CT surgery, interventional cardiology, interventional radiology. Venous disease may be the most um, uh, prime example of where you have multiple disciplines treating patients with, uh, uh, with venous disease, including uh, uh, folks that you wouldn't expect, uh, dermatology, general surgery and phlebologists, uh, hemodialysis access, and clearly um, peripheral artery disease. Justin went over this uh, a bit, you know, uh, the fear of collaboration or why I compete. I'm going to lose control of my patients. I'm going to train my competition. I will lose volume. I will not have access to innovation. P patients will go to other providers. But I think the key is if you have an organizational structure where you can collaborate, it makes a lot of sense. And um, in the Heart and Vascular Institute, we really have three areas, a tripartite mission of clinical uh, research and education that we focus on. And, and when we work 
well in this model, and again, it, this is not something that happens uh, just passively, it takes tremendous amount of effort, things go well in multiple in areas. And clearly the benefits are it can improve patient care, it decreases variability across the enterprise, there's access to resources, uh, increasing volume because you grow the pie, and you obtain fiscal data that helps guide strategies for the future. And let me give you just a couple of examples. So you have access to resources, things like marketing, things like uh, uh, clinical conferences, uh, uh, GME dollars, et cetera, that you perhaps would not have as a separate smaller entity. And we do a fair amount of marketing uh, uh, on a uh, you know a quarterly, let's say, basis. And we have collaborative groups that look at hemodialysis, uh, vein care, wound healing. And this, I think, helps also for the referring doctor and the patient where they don't have to worry about going to a specific person, but they go to a program and they know they're going to get pretty uh, compelling care. From a, from a research standpoint, I think we're fairly co uh, competitive for many of the large uh, national clinical trials, and we've had a significant increase in both the number of trials and the number of patients that we've enrolled over the last decade. And there are multiple competitive trials that all of you know of in the different areas of PAD, as well as for carotid disease, aortic disease, um, and other areas. And if you work together, you can uh, you know, increase the volume. And perhaps the best way to prove that to you is just show you the data. So this is uh, combined vascular OR and endovascular uh, procedures uh, that is combined uh, open and endoluminal procedures, regardless of venue, uh, across the system. And, and we've gone from, from a modest volume up to close to 5,000 cases last year. And that only happens when you work together as a team and try to grow the pie. And perhaps most importantly, we get the ability to track quality. This is specifically for vascular surgical open operations, uh, but we can look across the enterprise. We can look at the case mix index, which has increased uh, over time in blue. Length of stay has also gotten up a little bit, but the uh, mortality is, is, is dropping at least of uh, 2017. This is 1% for open vascular surgery, which I will argue uh, rivals some of the best places uh, in the country. Uh, Dr. Shishabur, myself, and Dr. Gornick, another uh, very essential uh, member who's a vascular medicine specialist, uh, come up with a uh, strategic timeline for the next five years. And this actually, we're going to re revisit this in another month or so, and we talk about different areas that we want to focus on. Uh, again, regardless of specialty. You know, we want to build the vein program. We want to build a vascular lab. We want to uh, develop a uh, uh, endovascular fellowship or a vascular medicine fellowship. Well, how do we do this and how do we uh, approach this uh, together? So ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, collaboration among physicians uh, in multiple areas and especially in PAD is not only feasible, but it's uh, beneficial in many ways. It happens well in an institute model where you can align resources and people. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, clearly leads to, again, growing the pie rather than fighting over the pie. So my, my conclusion is, yes, collaboration can beat uh, competition. Thank you very much.